Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Welcome to this next episode of a podcast you've decided to listen to. Not only is this podcast what you think it would be, of things that happen before your time, but maybe the time is before you. I am your host, Gelsey Laurie, and we are talking about, okay, I'm going to stop, guys, the Twilight Zone. We're doing our top five episodes. I couldn't hold it together for that. Let's just dive in and we're going to talk Twilight Zone. <laughs> to entertain you, we'll sing your songs, for good times, the best times, you can't go wrong, we'll two-step, a new step, it won't be long, when the Dixieland is up playing, soon you'll be swaying, so come on, sing along. Kelsey, we are just so close to October, the greatest month of the calendar year. You got Halloween, you got the birth of me. There's really not much else you can really uh, <laughs> rank with all the other holidays. And I love Twilight Zone. I know you love the Twilight Zone. So real quickly, for those of you who may be living under a rock, the Twilight Zone was created by Rod Sterling. He had done up into this point in the 50s, he had done a ton of well-received televised plays, but he kind of wanted to create a science fiction show that he could use to address a lot of his feelings of the politics of the time and attempt to address things like racism and sexism and just human struggles, but through the guise of science fiction. And despite the fact that my top five does not reflect this, I think what's really special about The Twilight Zone that people forget about a lot of the time is that just as much as it had really horrific twists at times, it also had plenty of episodes that ended with really hopeful twists of humankind being better than we are and being kinder than we are. Those aren't what's going to be on these lists though, at least on my end, because we're talking about our top five favorite twilight zone episodes and Mayan almost all exclusively fell into the category of things that really did scare me uh, when I watched them. <laughs> like, I love, I feel like I was curious if we're going to have any crossover on this, but I went pretty classic. Like some of mine, I was like, well, this is everyone's favorite Twilight Zone episode, but there's like a reason for that. Sometimes I'm not one to like, I'll give into the mainstream because I feel like there are things that there's a reason that they are what they are. I put, a lot of the big ones in my honorable mention list and tried to go for slightly deeper cuts. I figured you, but, I had a feeling you would. Yeah. But I think that even my deeper cuts are still more well known than some of the more obscure ones. But let's start with you. What was your number five? You always ask me to put them like in chronological order and I never do. Okay. So I'll say, I'm just going to rank them here. My number five is Midnight Sun. Ooh, that was on my honorable mentioning too. That is a beautifully shot episode of the it's Twilight Zone. season three, episode 10. And um, basically, like, the first tagline would be, like, the Earth falls out of its orbit and starts moving towards the sun. So that's – you are in New York City, and you're kind of basically following two women. It's Norma and her landlord, and the Earth is literally going towards the sun. So it's, it's not so much a notation, too, on global warming of, like, oh, we could do something about it. It's, like, literally just, like, nope, the orbit's fucked, and we're going to all die. But they, you're just watching them melt. And it, at one point, Norma and her landlord are the only two left in the building, you know, and it's just kind of humans are dropping left and right. And she, Norma paints 
to pass the time and there's barely any water. I mean, the whole time she's, they're just covered in sweat. I mean, I, I got, I get sweaty watching that episode. You get time. Ang- like, it is, it's stressful. It's like anxiety. It's- pro- oh my God. There's so much anxiety and she paints and she has this one drawing where she paints the sun and even the paint is melting and her landlord like loses it and is like, don't paint the sun. Like anything but that, like paint something cool and losing it. And they get, um, there's a looter that they let in and he's got a gun and steals her gun holds them up for their last of their water. And that's just like, cause that's, you know, all that's valuable. And as much as you like hate this guy immediately, he talks about the sympathy of losing his wife and child just died. And then you're like, fuck it's sympathy. And then the landlord dies. We're doing spoiler alerts, right? We can. Yeah. Like, oh, absolutely. We're going to spoil. Okay, good. I don't want to be reason. like, Oh, and then you like, don't like you to find out. Cause you're not going to watch it. I know you guys are not going to watch it. Well, like, and you just can't really real. talk about why you like these episodes without talking without about the, the ending. Yeah. Okay. I was like, uh. so then she becomes the last one kind of standing and then she wakes up and there's a doctor who's like, oh, your fever just broke. And you look, they show kind of a temperature or thermometer next to a window and it's snowing and there's a bunch of people inside and she's like, oh, and you kind of go, okay, it's a dream thing. Like that's a bit of Except a cheap it's escape. Not. Yeah. But it's not fully a dream because they're like, the the earth is actually out of orbit and it's spinning away from the sun. So it's constant darkness. It's freezing and they're all going to freeze to death eventually. So they're still doomed, but it's on the other spectrum. It's if, you know, she got sick and kind of went into these feverish nightmares to the other extreme. And it was probably her subconscious way of escaping just as bad as a doom yeah. to one end by ex- going to the extreme nightmare of the other. Um, and I love that like ending of like, Oh, you're fucked. <laughs> it's there's, still there's- like, there's two things in that episode I want to address. One is that there is a shot where the thermometer on the wall literally bursts and mm-hmm. it's like spraying the mercury all over the wall. And it's such a creepy, simple shot. And then, yeah, at the end, the really haunting scene is that she's laying in bed next to her landlord and she's talking about how great it feels to be cold because she's just mm-hmm. had this horrific dream and like the landlord's just like yes yes it's great but like the look on her face is like we're all fucked like the the yeah. acting in the in the landlord's face in that moment is unbelievable it's so good yeah that is one thing i want to say is every single actor on every single episode of the twilight zone is the best like they kill it yeah they just cast everything perfectly i've Yeah, yeah. There's not one bad egg. Like they're all just these intense. I'm like, oh my god. But I know that moment. Yeah, where it's, yeah. And I don't know. Some have like really good underlying themes that like I'll get into. But this one, no, I just I like it. I like that element of doom. All right, what's your number five? So my number five is the uh, season finale from season two, season two, episode twenty nine. I wanted to include a Burgess Meredith episode because he was in a lot of classic episodes, but I'm not doing the one that most people think of. Um, And this is an episode called The Obsolete Man. Um, And this is one that's not so much a horror one as it is like terrifying how much sometimes it feels like we are still fearful of this. Uh, And it takes place in a totalitarian dystopian type future where uh, Burgess Meredith's character is being put on trial for being obsolete as his previous occupation was as a librarian, but now books are banned and his occupation has made it punishable by death. And he has Mm. to appear in front of a court to make an argument for why we should keep books. Um, Mm. And it is just a really heavy episode. Uh, I don't want to, as much as I will talk about the twists in a lot of the other ones, this one, because it's probably the least known or talked about of the five, if you can track down an, a copy of The Obsolete Man somewhere, really check it out because it isn't really one that's so much about the the twists or the terror or the horror or anything like that. It's just a really it's just a really heavy episode. And I remember mm-hmm. I kind of passed by this the first time I watched it. And then my brother was talking about how this was one of his favorite episodes because it really just left him feeling so sad and numb by the end of mm-hmm. it. Uh, so I, I gave it a second viewing and I absolutely saw everything. Um, and I, I will say this was this is the uh, the closing narration of it. Um, 
which is it says here unusual sterling appears on camera to deliver the closing narration because usually he wouldn't it would be a voiceover um, while he made the gag appearance towards the end of an earlier episode sterling still delivered the closing narration off camera as he would in all of the other Twilight Zone episodes, except for this one. But his closing narration is, the Chancellor was only partly correct. He was obsolete, but so was the state and the entities in which they worshipped. Any state, any entity, any ideology which fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, and the rights of humankind, then that is the state that is obsolete. And that case must be filed under M for mankind when in the Twilight Zone. (laughs) <laughs> so this was like him really stepping up on his on his soapbox even more so than he usually would to really make a statement about just human kindness and human understanding. Uh, so that's that's my number five. That's the that's the deepest cut on my list for sure. All right. I like it. I like it. Yeah, I'm about to go into like um, my number four is everyone's going to go. Duh. But my number four is the classic time enough at last. Yes, that I, it's, also on my it's honorable such a, mentions. Yeah, it's like, ev- again, it's one of the top probably five most famous episodes, but there's a reason for it. And I just, it's the first season, episode eight, and it is the episode where Henry Bemis is um, a bookie. You know, he's got those real thick glasses. Long story short, like his wife is always like, why are you always reading this? That he never gets time to read. And it's just like, everyone's annoying. So he works at the bank and goes into the bank vault on his lunch break to read. And an H bomb goes off and causes total destruction. Every human dies. So when he comes out, he's the only one left. And so he's like, finally I get, and he's got all these books and there's that classic kind of rummage staircase out, like outside with just books everywhere and he's so excited he's left alone at last until eternity and he leans over to get a book his glasses fall off and he's got like thick thick glasses fall off and break and it's the the famous classic line of it's not fair it's yeah. not fair and now he's left with eternity of he can't see and he's got all the time in the world and all the books <laughs> it's just so dark and it's got to like, be twisted. one of the most it's got to be one of the most parodied moments of it, the Twilight Zone. Yes, a family show. guy's done it. Like that's the first time I love. I think it's like Peter's last brain cell. They like go into and it's like that happens and it's like his last cell and his glasses fall off. It is a horrific like he is now totally alone. And the only good thing about being alone was that he could read the past the time. The closing narration just for my own thrill is the best laid plans of mice and men and Henry Bemis, the small man in the glasses who wanted nothing but time. Henry Bemis, now just a part of a smashed landscape, just a piece of the rubble, just a fragment of what man has deeded to himself. Mr. Henry Bemis in the Twilight Zone. Let's talk about that, too. That opening, the music, it's so obviously iconic, but it is just eerie as fuck. It's eerie as fuck. And I think one of the things that people forget about is that Almost every one of the five seasons of Twilight Zone has a slightly different opening. Like the music is always the same. Mm. The narration is always the same. But like sometimes it's like a pan of like a sunrise and it's just like this steady shot. And then I mean, the most iconic one is the one that people connect with the Tower of Terror ride where it's and that's how I was first yeah, to the spiraling introduced. Yeah, the spiraling the door, thing the, the window eye. crashing. Yeah. That's not until that, like, season four. They didn't introduce really? that intro until oh, season four. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. All right. So my number four is from season one, uh, episode 34, is another one that's pretty iconic. It's not nearly on the time enough at last episode. But do you remember the episode, The After Hours, where the girl is shopping and she oh yes and she, the mannequins yes where she gets she buys attacked. the thimble upstairs on like lo- yeah. yes 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 so uh this one's pretty simplistic there's not a lot of beats to this one it's a girl shopping she buys something she wants to return it but she can't find the woman who sold it to her and then when she goes to point out that person it's a mannequin that looks exactly like the person that sold it to her and she screams and she passes out and they like take her upstairs to rest and then somehow classic 1959 i guess everyone leaves and forgets that she's up there and that's when all of the mannequins start to descend upon her uh and showing up and blocking the doors and she's trapped inside this building and this is when she finds out that she's also a mannequin and that once a month a different mannequin gets to spend a month being a person and roaming and she 
got so invested in being a human, she forgot. She forgot that she was a mannequin. <laughs> Oh, it's that so... That sounds like me on vacation. Yeah. I like forget I'm on vacation. I'm like, I live here and I'm a different person. Then I come back and I'm like, oh, what is this horror? Yeah. Oh, it is so... It, But it is. It is a very chilly... Mannequins are creepy. Like, I... Yeah. I, like, you work at Disney, but you don't work within the rides. I think about that every time I'm on any Disney ride of like, I love the magic of Disney, but if you needed me to say going clean the haunted mansion after hours with all of those mannequins around there's Mm-mm. no fucking way i could do it absolutely not <laughs> i'd be like no yeah no that one is good and the way it's shot when she's kind of like trapped overnight and the way all the um cabinets and everything stored and the mannequins and she kind of gets caught in this like claustrophobic maze of a department store yeah and, and the, the way that's done is really eloquently creepy and the mannequins keep just whispering her name. So it'll just cut to these lifeless mannequin faces and they're just going, Marsha, Marsha, <laughs> like over and Fuck over again. Shit. It's nope. so creepy. All right. So what's your number three? All right. My number three is the other one of the, I this was probably more famous than Time Enough at Last. And it is Eye of the Beholder. Ooh, uh, I will save my thoughts on that because that's later on in my list and I will not be moving it. <laughs> okay, I so did we both about, put that on? Yeah, we definitely both put that on. It, I was curious can, if you would do any class. Like this one is just like, do you want me to like wait and we can like co-talk about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about it okay. when I get to it on my list. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then I will jump real so, quick into my number three. Mm-hmm. One that um, I forgot about this episode entirely. And I do maybe like every five years, I'll do like a rewatch of the Twilight Zone. Um, but I was hanging out at my friend Andrew's house. Uh, we actually got together to play D&D. We finished our game of D&D and a group of other people wanted to play Magic the Gathering. Andrew and I didn't. So we went and sat in his living room and we pulled up the Twilight Zone when it was on Netflix. And we just picked a random episode. And we we're like, let's pick an episode that the name doesn't strike a memory with us. It's season one, episode 11. And when the sky was opened, um, and in the concept of this one, the American Air Force, uh, there's a group of military guys. They all were on a space shuttle, uh, and they've come back to Earth, and it was a successful flight. Um, And as the one's going to check in on the other three guys from the ship, he notices that one of them is missing, and none of them remember the existence of this one friend missing except for him. And he becomes obsessed with the fact that like there was four of them. Now there's three of them. No one remembers them. The next day he shows up and there's only two of them left. And now he's like completely losing his mind that like these people just keep disappearing out of existence. But the big twist of this one is that he goes to visit the person who's still in the hospital and is still there And as he opens the door, he disappears. And now the person in the bed is realizing that this panic that his friend had is very real because no one has any memory of him ever having a visitor. And the ex the existential dread (laughs) that runs through my body of thinking about the fact that I know that in a, a day I will blip out of existence and no one will remember me. And I have no way of convincing anybody that That that's what's going to happen is like the most (laughs) terrifying thing I could think of. That's why we make podcasts. So there's at least some kind of trace of us when we're not. I mean, the podcast would just disappear or it'd be like Mike Kelly from Connecticut would be your (laughs) host or something. Like, Look, I'm not going to read the whole closing narration on this one, but just the first line is once upon a time, there was a man named Harrington, a man named Forbes, a man named Gart. They used to exist, but they don't any longer. Yeah. That and then is, it goes on. But like, ah! that is horrifying. <laughs> that is so creepy and scary. But yeah, that is. I remember watching that at his house and just feeling like existential crisis <laughs> for for the rest of the, the night. Uh, all right. You're number two. Number two spot. My number two. Wait, I have the behold. OK, my number two is the dummy. Ooh, this I was season three, episode 33. Good one. That is a good dude. Again, back to the mannequins. Dummies. They're creepy. They're Dummies so are creepy. fucking scary as shit. Like it's so it's this guy. Um, he's a ventriloquist, Jerry Etherson, who fun fact is played by actor Cliff Robertson, who we later know as 
the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man's Uncle Ben. Same oh, actor. Look at that. Oh, I was like, Uncle Ben, <laughs> you look so handsome and young. Um, so he runs this dummy act with his dummy Willie, or ventriloquist act, in a small club in New York. And um he, the the dummy kind of starts to basically come to life and tanting um Jerry and blah, blah, blah. And um, Jerry's also drinks a lot. And so I think there's kind of this underlying theme. We'll get into that later. But um, he – Jerry's like – is convinced that Willie is alive. Yeah. And everyone obviously doesn't believe him. And they were like, you should get psychiatric help. So instead of doing that, he gets rid of Willie and gets a different dub- dummy called Goofy Goggles, which I love. And so now he only performs with Goofy Goggles and locks Willie in a trunk. But what's his name? Willie is alive and then becomes like he hears him from the trunk. He's on his couch. And it's kind of that taunting thing that we all – every Twilight Zone I feel like does. Blah, blah, blah. Basically, it ends where he goes into such like a, a paranoia – schizophrenia it's very early chucky vibes too like when he's holding the dummy willy and he's kind of like eyeing them from the side it has this eerie well but the very end of it it cuts to a a scene in a club and the announcer goes in the next act jerry and willy and the ventriloquist is willy and then the doll is jerry and it's so like such- the guy that looks like willy like turns to the camera and is like smiling and it's kind of this um it's, it's so such haunting. a creepy moment it's, it's so, so haunting good. and there's so many things about this. Um, one, like the way they film this, they do a lot of tilted angles at one point. Like yep. once he starts going more and more mad and they do that kind of tilted angle effect, which really plays in that you kind of go into that paranoia and schizophrenia with him that you're like, oh my God, I'm losing it. But for me as a performer, I kind of take that underlying theme too of his work is the vis- ventriloquist that he is so intertwined with it and this persona he puts on stage, but be it the dummy that he's created, that it becomes so powerful that he like loses himself to this doll. And then the doll becomes him. And now he's like no longer in control of himself. It's this, but for him, you know, it's specifically the dummy. But like I kind of took it more in my field of work. Um, and I think anyone could do it. Anyone that career takes over in this, that, but you start that kind of theme of like losing yourself to that, that you don't even know where one begins and one ends. And you, that completely takes control of you. It's, it, this is going to be a little bit more uh, soapboxy than I intended to be, but this is why being a performer, it's really important to also do therapy because there is a very, it is very easy to get lost within the mask that you wear in front of your audience and forget who you are behind that mask. And that can be really dangerous to your psyche <laughs> at a mm-hmm. certain point. Oh, I've experienced it. I've, I've yeah. fully experienced it. And it's this, that. And then there's also an underlying of, um, I read something that was kind of like, oh, this could be a theme of, you know, alcoholism and that how bad dr- drinking is for you. Or like, and yeah. I mean, I am a drinker, but you, you know what I'm saying? Kind of that, like, the 100%. more you drink, the more he lost himself into the character yeah the character and and that it's like a symbolism of alcoholism the dummy would be that and then that takes over and you become something that you're not yes no it's it's a brilliant episode yeah all right so my number two is it's the one that started it all it's it's episode one of season one where is everybody um it's such a creepy episode and I remember watching this sci- sci-fi network channel before it became SYFY used to do Twilight Zone reruns constantly. And I remember the first time catching this one on TV, it really just startled me. Um, and it's a guy and he's got no name. He doesn't remember who he is. He's walking around a town and he cannot find anybody everywhere he goes. Like it looks like life exists there. And then he starts seeing people. But as he goes into these different homes where he thinks he sees people, they're all mannequins and he can't find anybody. And then he eventually breaks and you, he starts screaming. There's this amazing shot where it looks like he's running towards the camera. And then he actually runs into a mirror that's in front of him. And we've been filming the mirror. Like it's, it's a ton of like really trippy out there camera shots. This is like, Rod Sterling, he's like, if I'm going to do the first episode, I'm going to make sure that visually people remember it. But he starts screaming, where is everybody? And then it just quick cuts 
and you see his head inside like a like a TV screen screaming and he has been in a sensory deprivation tank um, testing to see how he would handle the loneliness of outer space before they send him out uh, and he's failed the test. Um, but they said that he had been trapped in the booth for 484 hours uh, to to test his limits of loneliness. It is so creepy. And we are doing uh, the narrations once in a while when they seem like they're appropriate. So the narration that Rod Sterling does for this one is the bearer of the the barrier of loneliness, the palpable, desperate need of a human animal to be with his fellow man up there, up there in the vastness of space in the void that is the sky up there is the enemy known as isolation. It sits there in the stars waiting and waiting with the patience of eons forever waiting in the twilight zone. (laughs) Um, It is as a person who only very recently has become pretty content with the aloneness that I tend to exist in with like an empty house to myself. But as someone who for years really needed there to be somebody mm-hmm. <laughs> else around that episode just really hits on some of my deepest, darkest fears of just walking around your town and there being nobody there. And when the pandemic actually first hit and I would go on walks, I would think about that episode constantly. That's so true. I know I drove around a couple of times in like downtown areas where just like that kind of one piece of trash floating. And I was like, this yeah. is the f- like, I kept saying, I felt like I was, I hadn't seen this episode actually, but I kept saying, I was like, I feel like I'm in a twilight zone episode. Yeah. And this one, uh, it's noteworthy because there is literally no supernatural element. It is, it is not too far off from like, theoretical things that you would do like before you send someone in outer space you do have to like test their ability to be you know weightless for an extended period of time you really have to so it was kind of just sterling taking that concept and and tweaking it just a bit to uh pull into the real fear of isolation and loneliness that so many of us have let's hear your number one because i'm sure everyone has figured out what my number one is (laughs) I know. I was like, whoa, what's your number one? Actually, that's a great one to like end on. Okay. So my number one is the monsters are due on Maple Street. Can I ask you a question? Because we actually also recorded. We've already talked about this one. We, We recorded a Twilight Zone episode for the Christmas 365 podcast. And Dylan and myself are almost 10 years apart. But we both have vivid memories of having to read the script. Textbook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what we've ta- what you and I talked about it, this before. I don't know we, if it was on an episode, but this was in like I think that's why I picked this as my number one, just because I was at that age. It's probably like fifteen when I had to read it in literature class and yeah. did like comprehension questions on it and write a paper. And so now it's just so embedded of like it's, it's brilliant. So like I love that. Like, I know there's three people at least at a minimum who grew up at very distinctly different times in very distinctly different, different locations. Yeah. yeah. And have the same experience that we were all made to read this story. But it's a great story. It's a great story about paranoia. It's a great story. I think it's a great theme on um, humans and men. So this is uh, season one, episode 22. And it really just side note, obviously Rod Sterling is the creator and stuff. But like he wrote so many of these. Like his mind is just brilliant. I'm like. You're amazing. So snaps for Rod. Um, he also wrote the script for the Planet of the Apes. The did he first, really? Yeah, he wrote the script for the first Planet of the Apes movie. This plot, basically you come in and it's like this really charming little neighborhood, Maple Street. There's kids playing. There's cars. You know, it's all like dee, 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 dee. And um, there becomes, what would you say, like a a power, like the, the power starts getting all fucked up and and yeah. whatnot and so long story short the kids seem to kind of know what's going on because they're like someone up there is doing it and the then the adults are like someone's doing this who's doing this basically through the fear of the unknown it becomes a neighborhood like witch hunt against each other they're all like someone's doing this someone's against us and they're here in the in the neighborhood and so they all start turning on each other like they're just basically their power goes off first lawnmowers cars phones um but it it's one of the neighbors like doesn't go and so then everyone turns on him and then they anyways it just becomes this huge witch hunt and then you do at the very end of the episode 
um, it zooms out to two figures on a hill that are aliens. And that's the initial reaction that the kids are like, oh, it's aliens. And then you're like, oh, no, someone else is doing it, blah, blah, blah. And it, it gets to the point of like the mob that is within the yeah, neighborhood is so each hysterical. Other. Yeah. They are like killing each other, like full out riots, weapons, window smashing, fi- like bad, bad, like it's going down. So then – a nearby hilltop, there's a spaceship and a crew watching the riots go on, and they basically comment on how simply fiddling with the cons- – here it even says, fiddling with the consistency leads people to descend into paranoia and panic, and that is the pattern that they can be exploited. Oh, what? A f- so that's kind of – they are there to take over, but they're like, we don't even have to do anything. Just messing with the – I love that. The consistency of people's lives leads them to paranoia, and it does. It's We fear the unknown, and we are so quick to blame each other and turn against our neighbors so that there's a reason of something that we're not used to versus – either banding together or going, okay, this is just different. We have to address the narration. It's the best closing narration Rob okay, Sterling can I do has it? ever written. Yeah. Yes. The tools of conquest do not necessarily come with bombs and explosions and fallouts. There are weapons that are simply thoughts, attitudes, and prejudices to be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudice can kill and suspicion can destroy. And a thoughtless, frightened search of a scapegoat has a fallout of its own. For the children and children yet unborn, and the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the twilight zone. Ooh, that ooh, that is so good. That is yeah. one of the best speeches he's ever written. Hands it's down. so good. And the fact that like, it's so the, the ones that end that are the creepiest to me, like you get the creepy dolls, you get the creepy, are they going insane or is this really happening to them? And that's all like, sure, scary. You're like the child that has all the power and, and whatnot. But this one is like the fact that he's like, can't be confined. Like this is outside the twilight zone. This is what's going on now. And that like um, remark on that social comment on us now as humans and then, and it's still going on is so scary. Cause you're like, fuck, this is real. This isn't a twilight zone thing. And this isn't like a, Ooh, makes you think like that'll never, my, you're never going to be the last person on earth with my glasses falling off. But what's the theme there of where I spend time? Do I need humans? Blah, blah, blah. This is like, no, this is actually is the biggest killer and it's going on. And, and it's, Oh, it's so good. I know that is probably the best closing narration. That's why I picked this as my number one. There you go. Uh, I mean, the closing narration for my number one and your number three, Eye of the Beholder, is fine, but it is nowhere near that level. Um, Eye of the Beholder, this one just scared the absolute shit out of me as a kid. And like that reveal just so so the quick and dirty one is that this one is shot in a very weird way. You've got a woman whose face is all bandaged up. She is apparently very ugly and she's doing anything in her power to look beautiful again. Um on this version of this dystopian future, uh, ugliness is a crime and you will be shipped Mm -hmm. somewhere else where other ugly people live if they can't get a surgery to work. Now, what's unique about this is that everybody is faceless in this. The doctors, the nurses in the hospital, everything is shot in shadows. It's so cool how they shoot it. It's brilliant. It's it's so cool. They take off the, the wrapping around her face and it's this brilliant moment where one of the prettiest actresses you've ever seen lifts up her head and looks at the screen and you think as a viewer oh it was a success um and then you hear the doctor say oh we failed once again and then she looks panicked as she looks at their faces and when they flick on the light they have these horrifically mutated faces where their lips are peeled up and their noses are smashed in they're all bald like it is it is grotesque these the the practical makeup that they use for this and they ship her off to another planet where a very hunky guy shows up and is basically like you know it's tough being ugly but like you'll enjoy the planet that they send us to and blah 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 the point being like we are we are all beautiful in our own eyes hence the eye of the beholder uh but there's just something about the idea of I think this is why the idea of any type of plastic surgery always freaks me out is because I think of this episode and like, mm. what is, what is beauty? You know what I mean? Like what defines yeah. beauty? And it's, it's so true. And it's even, she goes off on like a brilliant speech um, when she's bandaged up about that and just being like, I don't want, I hate that we live in a world that I have to conform, but if I don't conform then I can't live here. And so it's like, I, I want to change because of that, but I hate that this is a problem. And doesn't she say something like, 
when she was a child, she's scared or her first memories is like yeah. scaring a child. And so she's like, I realize I'm like a harm to people in that way or – um, but – Ironically, the actress that plays Janet Tyler when she's bandaged up is Maxine Stewart. And then the Mac, the actress who plays Janet Tyler when she's unmasked is Donna Douglas. And they did two different ones because they felt like Maxine Stewart had the better acting ability of giving these monologues and had a voice that sounded more. I was going to say her voice is She so wasn't gruff. pretty yeah. enough for them. Um, yeah. She's still beautiful and she kind of like talks on how she hates that. She's like, it's ironic that we're doing a whole social piece on – the standards of beauty and it that being that this that and here in that episode for Hollywood they had to double cast it because I didn't hold that standard enough to be the yeah. beautifully slash they're <laughs> ugly but she's also like I I do understand enough that it is that you know they need that over the top bombshell beauty to get the point across but it is kind of funny that that's <laughs> they even did it in this episode to make that hey do you have an idea for a podcast but don't know where to start or do you have an already existing podcast that you want to take to the next level? Well, check out WeKnowPodcasting.com. From concept development to theme music to editing to logos, WeKnowPodcasting.com is a one-stop shop for all things pod. Don't hesitate to hit us up. We're very nice. So, Gelsey, you know, Rolling Stone magazine in 2016 ranked The Twilight Zone the seventh greatest television show of all time, which mm -hmm. hard to argue with that. Obviously, we just scratched the surface with nine tales that we told. Uh, did you have anything else on your honorable mentions list? Yeah, I did have a few. Um, Hitchhiker was a good one where the woman keeps seeing the hitchhiker and she's like, no one else can see him. So she thinks she's going crazy. And she calls her mother and they're like, oh, your mother's had a paranoid anxiety attack because of the death of her daughter. And she's like, what? But I'm not dead. And it turns out she is dead. And there was a car crash at the beginning of the episode and she did die in it. And it's kind of a classic Beetlejuice, the yeah. others, six cents kind of thing. But, you know, you got to remember at these times, those had not been created yet. And so a lot of these stories, this is the first time those twists. So that one. And then um, there was one, it's like number 12. They look just like you. Yeah. Is it number 12. You yeah. Like the number 12, pick, like the number kinda... 12 looks just like you. Yeah. The There's a hardcore like band and... that named themselves after that episode. It's the only <laughs> it's reason amazing, why I always know the course. name. <laughs> um, and it's a, you kind of have like a your number eight or number 12 and everyone has to go under surgery to look like the perfect man or woman. Yeah. And there's All one right. girl that's, you know, revolting against it. And it's another kind of image commentary thing. But yeah, I like those. So two that I had, and I'm surprised this one didn't make it on either of our lists, is uh, the classic Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Um, William Shatner inside of his plane going, there's something on the wing something of the plane. Something on the wing. Something. <laughs> I only think of Ace Ventura with that. <laughs> but it is, I, I think yeah. the biggest strike for that one for me is that I have just never once been scared of this weird monkey suit costume that they found for this character on the wing of the plane. Like The remake movie that they did, when was that? So like much better. Something? Yeah, that one was 80s. scary. That no, with John Lithgow. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that was like that was terrifying. I watched that one as a kid first before the original, and that one did scare me. Yeah, they did. I think that that is that's probably the best of the four remakes in that movie is for sure the their version of Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet. The other one that I wrote down, it's not. If you asked me to tell you about this episode, I'd barely remember it. Um, but it was an episode called Perchance of a Dream. Or per chance mm -hmm. to dream. And it opens with a guy going to a psychiatric office. Um, and he's so tired he can barely stand and begins to drift to sleep and then jolts awake. Um, and he starts to explain that he has a heart condition and he believes that his overactive imagination at night is getting to the point where it's so out of control because he keeps having the same dream over and over and over again. And he's convinced that if he reaches the end of the dream, he will in fact die. Is it the carnival one with like the cat yeah. woman? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. She's great. Yeah. 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 Like the visuals in this as you're inside of a, it feels like you're watching a dream. It's so nonlinear and everything is kind of abstract and it's just a beautifully mm -hmm. crafted episode, which is why I didn't put it in my, like my top five, because it's, it's not one that like, will sit with you forever the way that the ones that we've talked about have. Mm -hmm. But just if you're a person who likes crazy visuals, especially for like 1959, 
it is very impressive what they did with the visuals mm-hmm. of this one. But if there was any episodes that we forgot to mention that are your favorite episodes, where can people tell us about it? Yeah, please tell us on Instagram. You can find us at before my time underscore podcast. Send us a DM or just comment on one of our posts. We'd love to know or let us know on Facebook. Just search before my time. We will pop up right on our wall and be like, yo, you missed the best episode of Twilight Zone. And I'll be like, oh my God, we did. My bad. Let's be friends. Also, while you're here, if you wouldn't mind just throwing us a five-star rating and maybe uh, if you want to write a thing or two, that's up to you and your time, but it would really help us out and get us out and beyond the Twilight Zone. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Stay around for some more fun episodes. Bye! Listening to the Geekscape Network.